Hello, my name is Michael West. I have the pleasure of hosting this seminar on behalf of the King's Fund. It's been sponsored by IBM Watson Health and you're all very welcome to join us to focus on what is an enormously important issue, the health and well-being of healthcare staff. We know that 50% more staff in the NHS report debilitating levels of work stress compared with the general working population as a whole. And that has an impact, of course, on their well-being, but also on the quality of patient care. So this is an enormously serious issue at a time when the NHS is under huge pressures because of workforce issues. And I'm delighted that we've got four really eminent and uh, experienced guests to join us in the discussion. Uh, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves in turn. And if you would, to say a little bit about how you look after your own well-being and health at work. So beginning, first of all, with Mark Hurley. Thank you. So Mark O'Hurley, um, the Managing Director of IBM Watson Health. So it's a great question, how do I manage my own health? Uh, I certainly can't compare it to people in clinical practice. Um, I have been in clinical practice, and in those days, I think <coughs> I managed it through outside extracurricular activities outside of work to try and take the stress out of the day. I think today, in my current role, I think I focus mainly on managing the workload. And, and that, to, be, to be absolutely practical about that, which is focus on the one or two things in the day that actually does something impactful. It's easy to get caught up in the whirlwind and I could focus on 20 things, but I try and focus on the couple of things that impact either the people or the, or the customers that we're with. So about addressing that core issue of excessive right. chronic workload and making sure that I'm not being overwhelmed by all of these yes. activities that I could throw myself into. I could do loads. Great. But, yeah. Thank you. Anna Burhaz. Hello, my name is Anna Burhouse and I am the Director of Quality Development at Northumbria Healthcare and I'm also a consultant child and adolescent psychotherapist in a very busy child and adolescent mental health service. Um, and I guess I manage my work by making sure that I get outside actually, just, just even five minutes out of the building sometimes can be really, really helpful for me mainly I think because I was brought up on a farm and so it kind of puts me back in touch with um, those kind of outside elements. Um, and I think the other thing that I've learned over the course of my career is to build um, a team of really important connections. So at least for me, about six people that, are, that know the kind of work that I do that I can turn to and I can pick the phone up mm. and I can have a really good conversation with. Yeah, um, so there's something really powerful, Anna, about yeah stopping, going outside, being close yeah. to nature, and certainly the King's Fund has done some work reviewing all of the literature on connection with nature and well-being, yeah. but also the importance of connection and belonging and that sense of having social support. Yeah, Great, that, thank yeah. you. Dr. Harsha Shah. Thank you, my name is Harsha Shah. Um, I'm an obstetrics and gynaecology registrar, or junior doctor is the term that we see used quite a lot. Um, I've taken the last four years out to do a PhD, um, and just kind of developed an interest in this area just through seeing, you know, my colleagues and peers around me really struggling with this issue of burnout. Mm -hmm. I think personally for me I'm very lucky that I work in a very supportive team and I found that particularly since I've taken time out of training to do research I've found a very close-knit group of colleagues who I can turn to for anything really whether it's personal or professional and I find that that really helps and we make a really conscious effort to you know, support each other at work, but we'll go out for dinner once every couple of weeks. And I think that's really important to debrief outside of work um, and to have that time to really get to know each other so that when things are difficult, you know who you can go to. And that, that aligns with all of the research on team working in healthcare, mm -hmm. which suggests to us that stress levels amongst those who are part of a team that meets regularly are substantially lower than those who are not part of a if you like, an ongoing home team. Thank you. And Professor Don Berwick. <clears throat> I'm, I'm Don Berwick. I'm a pediatrician by training. I'm here as I am lucky enough to be several weeks a year as an international visiting fellow for the King's Fund, working with NHS England and improve, NHS Improvement. And it's just a delight to be here. Um, I, I'm sort of with Anna. Uh, uh, for me, the respite comes when I'm in the woods, in the forest. I'm lucky enough to have a a home in the, a weekend home in a very rural area and I I just can feel my blood pressure go down every time I'm able to spend some time there 
I think I did study meditation, uh, became a, 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 an enthusiast, but not a, not a practitioner enough, but I, I use it when I can, just uh, moments of settling. Um, and for me, if a little secret is crossword puzzles, I think that's how I meditate. I, <laughs> I, 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 I know when I finally, in, in the evening, get to sit down and do a crossword puzzle, I can feel everything get better. That's <laughs> why you can't finish it. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter, the stakes are low. Yeah. <laughs> And I've practiced meditation most of my adult life, and, uh, and I also find this connecting with nature is also hugely important in terms of my well-being and uh, my life generally. So our plan for this session is over the course of the next hour, I'll begin by asking the panel some questions. Um, we'd like to invite you to start submitting your questions to the panel. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box that says ask a question and then there's a little box below that where you actually ask the question and we will uh, warmly welcome those questions and we will put as many as we can uh, to the panel over the course of the next hour. We'd like to encourage you to um, encourage others to follow online, um, hashtag KF online and, and I'll say now that uh, in, in a little while we'll be able to put this online on demand so that others can access it too. But I want to begin by asking the panel um, some pretty tough questions actually. And the first question is, is this, we know so much about the link between staff health and well-being and quality of care, that if staff are under stress, that will have an impact on care quality. And that applies to all healthcare staff. And, and really the puzzle is then, why aren't our senior leaders focusing sufficiently on this hugely important issue. Don, can I begin with you with that question? Um, well, I, two things occur to me. One's a, a hypothesis, but it's maybe they don't take care of themselves first. Uh, leaders are under tremendous pressure and, uh, you know, it, it's got to begin at home. And I think maybe that would be a hint about how to lead away from this, this real very difficult era we're in. Um, I think the second, probably the most important to me, is tempo, which is, uh, you know, you, there, you don't get, you, it, it takes time to settle, whether it's walking outdoors or just, just being together or, or eating a meal together. And I'll tell you, when I'm out there in the NHS, I watch this, uh, the pace is just uh, extraordinary. And it's, 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 a, it's a vicious cycle because you, you're so busy, you don't have time to stop being busy. And, mm -hmm. Even if the literature suggests that doing that would increase productivity, actually, um, it's hard to spare the time. It takes courage mm. on the part of leaders to say, everybody, it's okay to stop. So this fast tempo becomes, it's almost like the hamster wheel is spinning and we just keep spinning it faster and it rather than... Us. <laughs> and then it spins <laughs> us. And then it spins us. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> rather than recognizing that by stopping and taking time out, we become more productive and more, s and more effective and smarter in the way we work. Mm -hmm. Anna? Well, I've been um, in a very privileged position in, since March of being doing some training for a lot of NHS boards around leadership for improvement. And um, what's really struck me through that work is um, how well intended many senior leaders are around this and how they know that this is a huge issue they keep coming up with but the how how do we do this well and how do we do this authentically as leaders and I guess echoing your thoughts too I've been just so struck by uh, a sense of empathy for these senior leaders because they have no time to do this and also one of the um, kind of unintended positive consequences of having time out to think about how to lead for improvement is they've got to know each other better and so on the evaluation forms it's been it's been nice to spend time with each other and get to know each other better mm. so I think having building those relationships and having compassion for each other and therefore somehow then being able to kind of mirror that and role model that for the rest of the organization is huge um, they're under such pressure and I think they're expected to almost be superhuman at the moment. Um, and when they're under that pressure, it's, very, it's a very human thing, isn't it, to pass that pressure on down the system rather than contain it and reflect on it and try and do something different. So I think that's, that feels a hugely important um, point. I mean, this issue of tempo and the issue of pressure, 
We know that the number one factor which predicts the stress of people in healthcare in our system is excessive chronic workload, chronic excessive workload. We know that it's the number one factor negatively predicting patient satisfaction and we know it's the number one reason why clinicians say that they're intending to quit. So it seems to me that cr chronic excessive workload has become like the, um, the pattern on the wallpaper here. We stop seeing it and yet it, it, it is, I think, the most significant issue. So, Mark, the, the work that you're doing, um, how can we begin to address this issue of chronic excessive workload? And have yeah. you seen any examples of good practice so, that we could Touching on a couple of the, the similar points, and I'd like to polarise it a little bit around the leadership, because we've done a, a lot of work with, with senior leaders around staff morale as a key mm. um, topic to discuss. And actually what we feel that the problem generally is, is they're not organisationally looking. They're looking at independent issues. There could be one issue in radiology, they'll, they'll focus down on that workload, or one issue in pharmacy, as opposed to clinician burnout is the organisational structure and everybody in the organisation will impact on that somehow. There'll either be not enough information available or there won't be anyone available to take the patient. Or you know, so We have to look at, as a leader, and then coming onto the, the technology side or potentially what you can do to help that, we have to look organisationally. So when you look at some of the work we, we've done recently, and I'll, I'll just reference radiology for a second, the RCR produced a report last year with... RCR? Royal College of Radiologists, yeah. sorry. Produced a report last year, um, which I think was published at the Royal S Society of North America. And they actually said that there was a quarter of a million studies that were waiting 30, more than 30 days to be reported. So that was a problem. So they've identified the problem. <coughs> and that one in three radiologists were, were referencing that they were burnt out or they couldn't cope with the workload. So actually though, we've worked with organizations and they're, they're feeling that part of the issue with, with that specific problem is the fear of not actually doing a really good job. They're, they're worried about, am I doing the go a good job? And what am I missing because of my workload? So what we've been working on a lot is, is providing some technology that's more of a safety net. So, so nothing to replace, more to augment, which would be also looking at reports, looking at images, highlighting discrepancies for them at the point of care. It's retrospective, but it, it's near, nearly at the point of care. And they're feeling that sort of, it's, it's investment in them, personally, that in the, in the absence of more radiologists, they have something else that is supporting them as well. So that's, that's some of the work we're doing around that. And, and what are, you know, the, the, the huge area of healthcare we must be concerned about is primary healthcare. We see that 39% of GPs are saying they intend to quit right. in the next three years because of workload yeah. issues. And uh, do you see any examples that are developing in the area of Small general? Small pockets care? of organisations are trying to look at people that, um, you know, the high risk people that come back mm. a lot to the GP practice and trying to understand why, first of all. Mm. Um, their challenge is the short amount of time they have. Um, the game that's being played where I need something as, as the person, you need to give me something as, as, the, as the GP. They want to give you as much information as possible in that short space of time, but I actually want to get a repeat prescription. Mm. So I think what, what I'm seeing is some of these organizations are looking at all the data and how they interact with people. Um, a great example recently was um, there was an obesity clinic that they brought everyone to and they brought a really really buff trainer to come in and everyone turned up, right? So everyone was there on the day, but then they didn't understand, first of all, what they got from that. How do they follow up with that? So we're doing some work around really analyzing the data they've got. Is it video? Is it content? Is it text? Is it a chat bot? How do they like to interact with the practice? So they are starting to think more about how do I get more out of my eight minutes or my 10 minutes with the, mm. with the patient. Okay, that's all. John, John, I want to come back to this issue of tempo and chronic excessive workload and um, I, I kind of have the sense that often our leaders are just not talking about chronic excessive workload. It's like it's, it's, like it's uh, that's the nature of the territory so we're, we're not <coughs> going to talk about it. And it. That seems to me to be really wrong. Yeah, um, I mean building on Mark's comment, and maybe we'll get to this later, I think there are things to do about that that, that need, you need the leaders to be uh, available to help with. I think we can reduce the workload. But uh, you're right, it's hard to talk about. I, I, I'll ask an edgy question about this. Uh, 
you know, to begin to tackle the problem, we move into a space of uh, affect. Uh, like the words we're using, you were yeah. using, Anna, it's about compassion, uh, love, um, s settling. And I don't know why it is, but I have the impression uh, that at the senior level, the, the, the words are more, they're more uh, macho, they're more, um, it, to talk, if you tried to talk about love in the C-suite, or uh, even, even I guess, compassion as a strategy, you, you might not be taken seriously. And, and so the conversation has got to start, and I don't know, maybe it's gendered, maybe it's because you know, we're still in a pretty male dominant environment, I guess, that here in the UK, certainly in the US, but uh, we need to introduce a vocabulary that makes it possible to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, is that, that, uh, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's what I'm No, I, that makes absolute sense. I mean, we, we are damaging the health and well-being of a significant proportion of our population. Yes. That is the very people we ask to promote health and well-being. And it, it, compassion is at the core of our health services. We know the link between compassionate interactions by clinicians and great patient outcomes. So it feels like that is the heart of it. There's a recent book just published last year mm -hmm. called Compassionomics. Mm -hmm. It was written by two physicians in the U.S., uh, not, not themselves academics, just two doctors who wrote about it, and they reviewed the literature on what you're talking about. It is phenomenally important, mm -hmm. but you c it, try to raise it in a strategy meeting with the board, and I, I think you might, you might run into some problems. My colleague, Maureen Bizzignano, who followed me as IHI CEO, uh, says you cannot give what you do not have. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're only interested in organizational effectiveness, let alone the well-being of the workforce, they can't give what they don't have. Yeah, and Harsha, this is uh, this for me is a, another big issue. Is our response seems to be very often to stress of healthcare workers to say, well, let's let's put on a resilience training course. <laughs> oh, I think it's one of the things that I find most frustrating, actually, um, that whenever we talk about burnout, we say oh, as trainees, as junior doctors, you need to be more resilient, you need to practice mindfulness, you need to go and do more yoga in your free time. And, you know, those strategies may be useful, but I think you're not addressing the heart of the problem, which is that if there wasn't some sort of organisational malfunction, burnout wouldn't exist, and so doctors wouldn't be burnt out. So if you're not addressing those issues, then you're struggling. I also think it's not helpful in some ways. I think if you go to a group of doctors and say, you're really overworked and you're burnt out, but you need to be more resilient, it becomes almost a sort of you versus us or them versus you situation. Um, and I think it makes people even more withdrawn um, and it makes it even more difficult to ask for help and to say, you know, I am struggling. You know, as Don was just saying, it's using those words and being compassionate. And I think that starts at medical school. You know, it's a very competitive environment and we're told that you have to be the best at what you're doing and you can't say no to doing things and just keep going and push through. And I think that, you know, you take that through with you through your training and I think, you know, our consultants and our seniors do as well. And so we've just become embedded in this culture where we can't say, I need a bit of help actually. Mm. And I think that's really a problem. Yeah. And, and I think it's, I, I guess I feel it's important to acknowledge the impulse of those who are introducing health and well-being programs that they, that's a compassionate impulse, they want to help. Um, but I guess what I hear you saying is that it's also about addressing the organizational structures and processes that, that are creating the problems in the first place. Exactly. It's easier to introduce yoga and mindfulness mm and Pilates yeah. and massage than it is maybe to address excessive cro chronic workload. How do we begin to change the agenda so that we're starting to address those underlying issues more? Well, I think, as you're saying, just addressing it, I think talking about it more openly and saying, do you know what, there is this problem of burnout. We appreciate as leaders that this is an organisational problem. Mm. I think that's sort of the first step to it, because I think at the moment it feels very much as though it's a problem with your generation as opposed to it's a problem that we're all facing together. And I think just starting at that and acknowledging that it's a problem would give people more comfort and confidence to say it is and now what can we do about it? I mean it feels like it's acknowledging the problem shouldn't be difficult. We've yeah. got 100,000 vacant posts in the NHS, mm, yes. 40,000 nurse vacancies, yeah. we've got GPs intending to quit, we're having huge problems recruiting people, 
and our sickness absence levels are, what, d double those in the private mm -hmm. sector. And, and this is a problem across the whole of our system. So it, it, it feels like the time is now to begin to address these issues. Okay. How do we make, how do we go from a situation where the NHS is clearly one of the most challenging places to work to make it the best place to work? Anna. I, I think we have to start <coughs> by deeply listening to staff and uh, hearing about their experience and um, I think for senior leaders that means being um, tolerant of some very distressing messages and um, listening to what's going on and, and trying to make um, the workplace a psychologically safe place that people could not only raise concerns but they can also sometimes take a bit of a risk with a new idea and try and put it into practice and sometimes fail at that. Um, and that we get braver, I think, and more skilled at having difficult conversations so that um, we don't walk by by practice. We, um, in a compassionate way, if we see a poor behaviour, we might ask well, what's causing that. Um, we think, you know, over 40% of organisational life is habitual. So how do we, how do we have a good look at our habits and how do we start to embed some really good habits into our organisation? Tom? Yeah, uh, I, I think of the challenge at two levels. What I can't help thinking of it as a systems issue. Yeah. Uh, the ED is overwhelmed, or A and E is overwhelmed, and you can't get people or people are in trolleys, and you've got pressures. Why are the people on the trolleys? Because there's no beds. And up on the floor, they're scurrying around because the beds are full. Why are the beds full? Because people who are ready to go home can't go home. Why can't they go home? Because we haven't invested in community resources that let them go home. I mean, so it's all connected and, and stressing the system, even adding more staff in the A&E wouldn't actually, it's yeah. just, just a sticking plaster, you call it here, I think, a Band-Aid. So thinking in systems terms helps. I think there are some simpler things to do. Um, three that occur to me when I travel around uh, are digital solutions, such as you're working on. The, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, and moving into the modern age in help, reaching help to people will if we do it right, if you'll do it, just do it, uh, you'll find that demand is much easier to handle because you're being smart. You're not requiring people to move around. You're moving knowledge, not people. A second is invest, I interrogating the work to see what work isn't actually helping anybody. Mm -hmm. and, ha and the workforce knows, and just let them stop it. You know, what, don't, don't go through the motions, which are reflected in all sorts of the stuff, the, especially the registrars and junior docs have to put up with. The third would be my recommendation to England, which is stupid rules. Um, organizations and countries acquire rule bases which don't make sense. They made sense when they started, but they don't make sense now. I learned uh, examples of this from Zoe Radner, who's a dean, I think, of, of business uh, in uh, Leicester, I believe. Uh, you will find that there are a lot of requirements that are leading to your burn, to your workload that they're actually myths, or they could be changed by administration, or their habits. What, what did you say, 40? Over 40% is what they, people say, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I would have a stupid rules week in the NHS in which everyone is licensed to say what requirements just don't make sense. They made sense once, or they make sense locally, but they don't make a sense systemically. Mm -hmm. And then I'd follow it by a break the rules week which you just stop doing it. I think I do think there's quite a bit of and that. East London Foundation Trust did uh, did did just that rules, yeah. with their mm -hmm. staff and uh, discovered that about thirty percent of them, I think, weren't rules at all. But peop they'd come to be seen as they're, rules. They're yeah, we yeah. did it. Yeah. Harsher. I just think things become so embedded in the culture, yeah. don't they? And yeah. we do yeah. it because it's always been done, as it's what's expected. Yeah. And it is. It's having that power to challenge things and mm -hmm. say, but why are we doing this? And I think again, that comes down to culture that. We were saying earlier that medicine's still very hierarchical, um, and I think that in itself needs to change if we're going to address this, you know, issue more globally. Um, that you know, you've got to give juniors the power to say this doesn't work. Why are we doing it? We shouldn't do it just because it's always been done in that way. So you're saying that w one of the ways that we can make the NHS the best place <coughs> to work is by giving everybody voice and influence exactly. to create fairer cultures that. <laughs> Are not are not muscle bound by too much irrelevant activity. Is that is that right? Habit and myth. Absolutely. Habit, Habit and myth. myth. I, I think we have to reduce the stigma. So yeah. I think there's an element of everything we're talking about. It's stigma attached, mm -hmm. um, and stop trying to you know treat the symptoms and find the cause. And I think um, 
in some cases, and again, you referenced obviously telehealth, telemedicine, all these areas, but I think sometimes these leaders have to step back away from technology and processes and actually get to the deep cause of what's in, the, in their organization. I mean, we can look globally, we can look regionally, nationally, but actually their responsibility is their organization and their people. And I think that if we reduce the stigma, immediately people will embrace their compassion as a leader by reducing the stigma. And I think they'll be more open to going, these are the real causes. It's not that person or this person. It's, the, yes, this technology is good, but what they, what they tend not to do, and again, I've experienced this, is actually praise good work. So we bring a lot of systems in to replace old systems. In most cases, they, they say they digitize the process, but they don't really add benefit to it. So by it's not really digital transformation if you're not adding something. Yeah. And what happens is you lose some of the good work that's been done by people, and they don't digitize the good work. So I think there's an element of reduce the stigma, uh, be compassionate as a leader to take that first step, and I think you'll be more open, the people will be more open to telling you the cause as opposed to trying to fix everything. And we've known for years, haven't we, that if you want to introduce an IT system, you begin by talking to the people who it's are going to be it's it's who are going to use it. So, yeah. look, let's go. Um, thank you very much. Let's go to um, some of the questions that that uh, our viewers are sending in. I'd like to pick up a couple that are kind of related. Alison Thwaite says, "How can we create sustainable change and stop gathering meaningless data and focus on quality, not quantity?" So, so that's one, and I think there's a related one, um, which is. How do we address burnout when the management structures are target-driven and unresponsive to feedback about team morale? That's from Monica Ramirez. So they're kind of related questions. Anna. So I think sustainability is a really huge issue. Um, I think what you often see is um, a real kind of emphasis on innovation and doing new things. And um, if you look at NHS staff awards, for instance, which are brilliant, I mean, I love them. Um, you, you go in and you see all these incredible stories of people's passion and intrinsic motivation to change. But you'll see that they normally celebrate innovation they don't celebrate sticking with something. Uh, they don't. They they often don't kind of celebrate the fact that we, um, you know, we rely on people day in day out to do the same thing. And so, actually, I think that it's a real cultural issue around sustainability as well. How do we celebrate the people that are doing a good job day in day out, but don't maybe make the brand new news as well as embracing innovation? You've got to have right. both, yeah. Yeah? yeah. But there is something I think for me about the people side of sustainability, which is how do you keep going? How do you celebrate that? How do you work as a team to constantly review what you're doing and constantly improve? Mm. Certainly, the most frequent complaint I hear from staff is that you know, I had four 13 and a half hour night shifts in a row. I didn't have time to go to the toilet, yeah. let have a look, have a yeah. drink. Yeah. Um, but apart from patients and service users, no one ever comes and says thank you. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's something about that yeah. appreciation. I yeah. saw something brilliant uh, that's quite related in, in mm. Birmingham um, in my visits this visit. Um, I went to the, I was taken to Birmingham Children's Hospital and visited the pediatric intensive care unit there was a young intensivist, his first name was Adrian, I can't remember his last name, who invented something, which is exactly this. He noticed that uh, the, the incident reporting was all about bad things, mm -hmm. so that uh, when something went wrong, you reported it on a sheet and something <laughs> may have happened about it. But he also noticed good things, and he set up a little local incident reporting system where mm -hmm. when something really neat goes on, uh, you, that's an incident report, and the that's smart, but brilliant is it doesn't, he doesn't really care about pattern recognition or the, the idea that that's all accumulated. That report that something really great happens goes back to the person wh who, who was involved in doing something great. It's a simple idea, yeah. celebrating excellence. So when success again. So yeah, and it's automated. Yeah. It's, a, it's on a computer. I think it's yeah. spread around the hospital. It should become standard in England. I think yeah. it would be yeah. great. Yeah. So the, the, the data question was, was quite interesting. Um, so less than 1% of the world's data we currently analyze, less than 1%. And it's, it's not because we can't, it's because we don't know what to analyze. And I think the question is really put to us because I think that's a person that produces loads of data today that probably doesn't know where it goes, doesn't know if it's valuable. Am I triplicating it? Am I putting it into three different systems at once? Um, I think it comes down to, again, back to the cause and effect, which is 
when we put any system in or we collect any sort of data, we have to question, we have to step back and go, why am I collecting this data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we do a lot of good work for registries in hospitals around the country to give us more information back. That's a good reason to, to, to gather data. We talked about a data donor earlier when we were off, off camera, which is if you ask somebody to, to have their data, they'd probably say no. If you ask them to have their data for the benefit of cardiovascular disease, they would immediately put their hand up. So I think mm -hmm. transparency on why we're collecting it is probably important to people because they will probably be more prone to getting it at that point. And it should be useful. Harsha, did you want to comment? Yes, um, I was going to um, just say we were talking about rewarding people um, and I think that's such an important thing that we don't really talk about and we should be talking about more. Mm. Just that simple thank you and I think you know I think actually our patients are really fantastic at doing it um, and it's you know it's really lovely when patients come back especially to say you know thank you for the care that we received but actually even just receiving an email from your consultant or your supervisor means so much um, and I think that always sort of makes it you know it can take you from the tipping point of things just being too much to it is a lot and there is chronic workload you know we are overworked and overstretched but we're really appreciated mm. um, and I think that's really important and you know the research suggests that we we systematically underestimate the power of our expressions of gratitude on the other and my sense is, as long as we do it authentically and thoughtfully, we, sh we could be, as leaders, we should be saying thank you ten times more. So there's two questions here from a kind of heartfelt questions. Carol Munt says, look, frontline staff often don't get, even get time to take a break for a meal or a drink. How do you think they could take time to wind down? It's a real challenge. And then, and then there's a, a, a similar kind of question in a way of saying from Jonathan Sampson, who says, we're talking about how the system changes culture, but surely we need to acknowledge that a lot of the pressure and cultural expectations originate with our politicians mm -hmm. and how they deal with, with, with the system. Don, you've had a lot of contact with politicians in different countries. <coughs> yes, uh, well, let me comment on the first comment also. Yeah. There's a, a book about to come out by Steve Swenson and Tate Shanafelt on burnout. Mm -hmm. And they've done a literature res review of what what matters, what matters most is meaning in your work. People mm -hmm. don't get burned out when they less, mm -hmm. they're less likely when the work feels really meaningful and it's acknowledged. But what they call commensality also appears. That's eating together. Mm -hmm. And I watch, you know, mm -hmm. organizations under stress, the first thing they do is take away the coffee mm -hmm. cups. Mm -hmm. That's a bad mistake. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the way we relate to each other, you have to have a platform for, for, for relation. The political side, I don't know what to say. Um, it's the same all over the world. It's particularly vicious now in a politics of populism gone awry and separateness and otherness and exclusion and mm. xenophobia and racism. And we certainly have to fight that. That generates, I think, a lot of stresses in society, which are reflected in the healthcare system as well. I don't know what to say to the politicians. Um, if they could just take a breath, you know, just mm. give, the, give the people a chance to do the right thing. You, maybe your job in political leadership ultimately is to take away obstacles for people to do the things they know they should do. Mm. But that's a very hard sell. Politicians seem to be too ready to try to take control, probably because they're afraid. Uh, but it, it doesn't work out that well. Um, here, you, know, you have a civil service that stays through. You have people that, that last through the political cycles. They're very, very important. They're sophisticated. And if they get the idea that um, the job is more release than control, things can go okay despite the politics. That would be my hope. Mm -hmm. And it's about increasing, I guess, this cultural awareness of the centrality of compassion in our, in our healthcare yeah. system. Have there culture. been successful politicians that have built on that and made their careers by being the spokespeople for, for caring? Uh, maybe, yes. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about what you were saying about eating together and sort of that side of compassion. We've just um, 
been involved in a fairly large study of about 3,000 uh, obstetrics and gynaecology trainees and consultants and found that almost half of trainees and a third of consultants are burnt out using sort of validated tools. Um, and it really made me think about the way that teams have changed. Um, so I know that when sort of I started my foundation training, you had a team and you knew your team really well and you worked with the same team for three or four months. Um, and they got to know a lot about you as a person, as well as how you work and what motivates you at work and the kind of tasks that you enjoy doing. Um, and the way that the kind of the structure of the NHS has changed and rotors have changed so that we're not working too many hours means that you can be in a clinic one day with one consultant, you can then in the afternoon be with a different registrar or a different consultant, and you don't get to know people. And so you don't sit and have lunch together or you know make the time to go and have coffee together or a drink together after work because you just don't really get to know each other on a personal level. And I wonder if that, you know, I'm sure there must be a pretty big impact of that on burnout levels and the way we communicate with each other and how compassionate we are. Yeah, we, as a species, we, we're built to connect. Yeah, we, yeah. we want to connect, yeah. we want to be close, we want to belong. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem is that we, if we manage organizations in ignorance of what it is to be human, then it's not going to work. And we know that kind of core human needs at work are about the need for autonomy and control not being forced, coerced, the need for belonging, as you say, in teams, in organizations that are just and fair, and the need for a sense of competence, that I'm not so overwhelmed by, by workload, yeah. that I don't feel I can do my job effectively. So, uh, and certainly, you know, I've had the privilege of being involved in an inquiry for the GMC over the last two years into the mental health and well-being of doctors, and, and I think the issues relate to the whole healthcare workforce. We have to address how we meet people's core workplace needs to ensure their motivation and well-being. Anna? Well, I think there's a, an amazing wealth of knowledge coming from neuroscience really about mm. what, what we could do if we took a brain-based approach to an organisation or a system. You know, our, our brains are designed really to, to interact with other people, to process emotions through relationships, um, to help us think about how we go from, you know, when we're in distress or shock or fear, from kind of fight, flight and freeze responses into kind of more rational thinking. Um, and so I, I genuinely think it's time to bring some of that kind of really key knowledge into our approach around uh, how we support staff and build some of that into the way that we structure our organisations. And I think yeah. the final thing I'd say about that too is that we're seeing a lot of schools becoming like trauma-informed schools and organising around how to help people process trauma. What do we do in the NHS? Day in, day out, we process trauma and yet we don't actually have a focus on that very often in the way that we design our structures or think about our teams yeah. or embed debriefing into well, the way we work. It's a, it's a place where um, there's a recognition, particularly for children that have had adverse childhood ev events, that actually if you create psychological safety, um, that will s reduce the shame that you're talking about around the stigma that will help people to learn from events. Um, and it's an organisational approach to really addressing some of these deeply rooted psychological issues and um, acknowledging the way that our brain works. So let me, uh, we've got lots of questions coming in. I'm going yeah. to pepper you with a number <laughs> of questions, okay? So um, I'm going to give you three just for, for starting. Um, this is from Sonali uh, Kinra. She says, if we're bringing our whole selves to work, aren't we more at risk of burnout? How, how can we be passionate about work and be emotionally involved and still not get burned out? So, so that's one. And then there's another one here, that coming back to senior leaders from Claire Fletcher, who says, wouldn't it help if senior leaders shared stories of their own vulnerability and their fear of Definitely. failing? Mm -hmm. and, and, what, and what does the panel think of, about blaming individuals for when things go wrong? So um, three <laughs> questions there. Uh, are, so so the, the first one is, uh, is around bringing our whole selves to work. And, and the dangers of that uh, potentially, and senior leaders sharing their vulnerability. And the third one is about 
blaming individuals when things go wrong. Um, I'll take the authenticity one. <laughs> okay, you go ahead. Okay, yeah. I'll go for that. Yeah. There's an awful lot of research that says that um, bring, being your authentic self and, an, and encouraging authentic relationships is mm. really important. The way that our brains are wired, we look at faces mm. and we notice a dissonance between the body language and what we say. Mm. So I would say absolutely bring your whole self to yeah. work. Yeah, There's no other really option. Yeah. 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 Great. Harsha. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I very much echo that. And I think it would be a shame if we didn't bring our whole selves to work as doctors, as clinicians, um, because your patient needs that whole, you know, the entirety of you mm. so that you can help them in the best way possible. It's why we all went into medicine in the first place. I don't think that in itself leads to burnout. Um, I think if you've got coping strategies and emotional support and organisational support so that when you're not at work, you can de-stress. I think that's the important thing here. And what about Shibi Rahman's question, you know, as a doctor, what, what do you think about blaming individuals when things go wrong? I hear from doctors their real anxiety about things going wrong yeah. and them ending up uh, making a mistake Definitely. that they are publicly pilloried for. And I think things are changing. Um, I'm very lucky to work within obstetrics and gynaecology where a lot of work has been done. You know, we're a very high acuity specialty. Um, we're a very high risk specialty. And lots of work has been done around, it's a systems thing. It's not an individual person. You work as a team and therefore if something goes wrong, it's the team that needs to look at how we could have done things better. But I agree, it doesn't happen, you know, through all specialties, it doesn't happen you know across the world and it's a really important thing because we all worry you know we all um, will go home and think gosh should I have done this or should I have done you know x y or z at work and if you're lucky you've got colleagues that you can call and say I did this do you agree with it or you know should we call that patient back but I think if you don't have that team support and structure around you it would be really detrimental to your mental health. And if we're not creating a sense of psychological safety, mm. to use the jargon, yeah. in, in, in the workplace so that people can feel supported and that they can learn. Mark? So it, I th there seems to be a theme. I think it, it comes back to the person saying they want to bring themselves. I think if you bring yourselves, you have to bring your compassion, mm. which comes back to compassion. You can't bring compassion unless you bring yourself. Um, I think if we look again there was a question around the politicians as well I want to tackle that because I think I think it's important to take ownership of your own organization sometimes and I think there's a lot more we can do from within and you know again coming together as teams sharing the problem as a team um, you're, you're more powerful as a unit going with a problem than you are as individuals um, and I think creating that overall bonds of shared experience is something that will definitely come through more and more um, across all of those themes, across all those questions, because it, the blame's together, you know, the, the, the problem is together. And I think that you tend to see teams win well together or they lose well together. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, um, the, for me, the whole theme around compassion and, and culture and leadership, and I, I like the question around the leaders being open. You know, if you, if, if you come with anecdotes of yourself, you connect with someone because they can, they can connect with the fact that you feel what they feel. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think leaders have to be more open like that as well. So if you share your vulnerabilities as Absolutely. a leader and share your mistakes, you share then your you human. make it yeah. safe for other people to mm -hmm. share We're, we're human beings, not human doings, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. Yeah. You know, we have to be aware of that, you know, be aware that we, we, we're good together. Yeah. And, yeah. In, and it's about embracing our own flaws as well, isn't it? It's not mm. pretending that we're perfect, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. Hello, my name is Anna. I'm a bit bossy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's about practicing as well the skills of compassion, the skills of being present with the other rather than beating ourselves up because, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm too preoccupied at this minute. So it's about yeah, celebrating progress in terms of yeah. we did skill. A, I did something recently with my, with my own team around um, just every sort of month or two months, we'd literally share what are you doing well, what are you not doing well yeah. as a team. Yeah. And very open, very transparent with each other. Um, and it generally was, you do too much of this, stop doing it, was the bad, <laughs> right? Yeah. As opposed to being really pointed at people. Yeah. <laughs> but it's incredible when you get to a certain point or a certain level in an organization or, or you get to be a senior leader, no one gives you feedback. Mm. Because there, there's either a fear over the feedback or there's a stigma over the feedback. But actually, you want feedback. But you get to a certain level in an organization, you never hear anybody saying good or bad about you. Mm. So I think it's important to, to give good and bad. 
feedback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's oh, sure. a really interesting point. You know, talking about the study that we've just done, we were looking at the association between burnout and defence medical practice, and we found that consultants practice more defensively than trainees. There's a very strong association, though, between burnout and defensive practice. And I wonder, you know, that's part of it. Um, why are we seeing it more in consultants? Because they've not got anybody to go to and say, I was involved in this case, I'm worried about it. They have changed their practice because of it, but there's no other way to do it because there's no support. No and we don't, exactly. And we don't talk about psychological support very much either. You know, there's no formal way in a, in a hospital where as clinicians or as nurses or as midwives that you can go to a support system and, you know, that's dedicated to psychological support for the things that we experience as clinicians, which are really different to other workplaces. Yeah, one of the questions here is about should we be ensuring more pastoral care? Should we be ensuring more support for clinicians to deal with some of the tasks that are not <coughs> using their skills? And there's a question from Tom Johnson who says, do you think that the leaders are under pressure are struggling to demonstrate compassionate leadership because of stress? Um, or is there a lack of leaders within healthcare who are naturally compassionate and can we develop the skills of compassion in leadership? So, so it, and, and it's, it's an important question because mm. it's a question I get asked quite often. You know, can we develop the, the skills of compassion in, in leadership? Don? I think yes. Uh, I, you know, I'm a pediatrician. You watch children. They're natively compassionate. It, it, we we yeah. start compassionate. Yeah. So it's, that means we, it's been unlearned. And I think, uh, yes, I think it can be su supported. Uh, it may be their skills, uh, and, uh, and we need to return to it and make the vocabulary acceptable. I would say to leaders um, some things I would recommend if you want to learn it better. Don't blame. This blame question, N never blame. Just it, stop it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't blame. Yeah. It, 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 there's a story behind everything you want to blame, and it's not... A, it's not generally at all going to be the person so that's something to stop something to start back to what Harsha was saying you know you you know the literature better than me Michael but I think it's true that people feel so much better not when they get a gift but when they give a gift that's far more powerful and I don't I think as a leader one of the best things you can ever do is to is to take what people wish to offer you. So, uh, I would make yes buttons and as a leader say, whatever, you, whatever you'd like to do, the answer is yes. Because once the, the take the junior doctors, um, you know, I, we've lived through that lesson learned about the junior doctor strike. With the junior doctors I met, they want to help. They, they see things and the, their burnout is, I want to help but they won't let me. So change that and that's uh, the act, act, an activity of compassion, that what, sure you can learn to do that, just, just say yes. And the studies that I've seen um, reported in Compassionomics actually about the training in compassion are overwhelmingly positive yes. about the impact of that harsha. And I think it really needs to start early on at medical school. You know, so much of the focus at medical school, understandably, is on technical skills and the knowledge that you need mm. to treat patients. <coughs> but we sort of, it's almost just kind of sideline this bit on compassion, but also leadership as well. Mm. Um, and so then you get to a stage in your career where it's expected that you will suddenly become a leader overnight and know what compassionate leadership is. But if we don't teach it from the very beginning yeah. alongside all the other important things that we're teaching, I think we're really missing a trick. And it does seem to me increasingly, you know, the more I explore this area, that compassion is core to what it is to be human. As you say, we're kind of hardwired to want to help and give. And when we're compassionate, we connect, and connection is what being human is all about. So I think this issue of, um, of how we develop this leadership is fundamental, and we have to have uh, and I'm pleased to see that there is progress across all of the four UK countries in a commitment to developing compassionate leadership mm -hmm. at all levels. Anna. And I think we should, um, in a way, also think about leadership in a broader way. You know, in Northumbria, we collect, we're a big fan of collecting stories, and we collect stories about what leaders at every level in the organisation have done to improve care. Um, thinking about patient experience and increasingly about staff experience too. So I think there's something about how do you create a culture where you recognise and spot, spot compassion in action and how do you make sure that that is culturally recognised and supported and embraced and celebrated. 
so that you're in, you're almost embedding it into the DNA of the organisation that that's what you do. Yeah. So Mark, your responsibility is for Europe, Middle East, Asia, for IBM Watson Health. Yep. And one of the questions here from Sarah Bird is, what does good look like in other countries? And there, there's a kind of follow-up, does it come back to adequate staffing levels, which then provide the foundation for other essential practices of self-care, compassionate leadership, no-blame culture, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, so what's good look, what does good look like in other countries? And, and is it about the numbers of staff that well, we have? I mean, it's a great question, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a mix, really. I think if you take, I mean, the, the UK's issue is the population. It's large, and it's large in comparison to all other European countries. Um, most of the areas where we've seen the greatest impact, because there's still shortage of radiologists and oncologists in eastern, southern, southern eastern Europe, um, but they have a very regional mindset. And I think it's, they have a, more of a lack of oncologists, more of a lack of radiologists. They embrace telehealth more, they embrace telemedicine more. They know they still have the same volume of patients and the same workload, but they're, they're embracing more of the uh, causes as opposed to treating the symptoms. So I think good, again, come, it still comes from, I'm not saying the top down, but it comes from within the teams in the organizations or the regions to actually identify what's our biggest rock that we have to fix here. And in most cases they focus on, it could either be a care pathway, Normally is normally the focus, as opposed to just a disease. Um, but yeah, I see some great work in the Middle East going on um, around health authorities that are looking at not just uh, claims, but fraud, waste and abuse. They're looking at traffic patterns, so rise and falls of A&E patterns. Um, they're trying to be more predictive. So I think good is good for me is predictive. It's just being much more predictive in your mindset. Mm. So um, Daniel Turton um, has asked, what evidence do we need to gather to put pressure on organizations to treat their staff better? Do we need to link evidence to patient outcomes, to productivity, or is staff well-being a sufficient goal in, it, in itself? So we're on a bit of a journey in Northumbria to collect staff experience measures alongside patient experience measures and see if we can triangulate that data, because our hunch is it really matters to, to, to put staff well-being at the heart of the organisation. So for me, I think, you know, through people like yourself, Michael, there's actually loads of evidence mm. about this. So now is the time for the action and the how. And that's what I've been hearing from boards around the country is how do we do this well, you know. So we have very clear data, don't very we? Clear that data. We, we know that um, actually, if we want to know what really predicts the performance of NHS trusts, yes if we look at staff experience from the staff survey, there is no better predictor, nothing comes close. So where staff report poor health and well-being, subsequently we see significantly worse care quality, worse financial performance, lower levels of patient satisfaction, and in the acute sector, higher levels of avoidable patient mortality. So it feels like the evidence is clear, but I, I, thi and I, I think we're at a crisis point where we have to act. And, th and that's why I think the people plan is really important in terms of making the NHS. And I think it's a great aspiration. Let's make it the best place to work. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm going to ask you in a moment to, to kind of, yeah, some thoughts about what you would, uh, some key thoughts that you would want to leave our viewers with um, that you think would be helpful. Um, But there is a question that's come from Joanna Maraki, the GMC actually, who says, what do you think should be the number one priority for NHS leaders for improving the well-being of these 1.4 million people who make up the NHS? It's a tough question. <laughs> Mark? Oh, good. <laughs> I get it first. <coughs> so, it, again, I know we keep using the same words, but I think the number one thing they have to focus on is the compassion around how do I reduce the stigma in my organization, make my teams more open, understand the cause, don't treat the symptoms. It yeah. really is getting away from treating and fixing and getting back to what are the causes for this. Because you made the point earlier, everything is intrinsically linked. Mm -hmm. So the, the cause are the people and there's nothing else that impacts the patient but the people in the organization. So I think the number one focus has to be get back to the cause, not treating the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I would say take a systematic approach whilst also really understanding the impact on the individual. So for me, it would be how do you get teams working really, really well together to support each other? How do you get compassionate leadership at all levels? And how do you make it psychologically safe to say when it isn't OK? Mm. It's astonishing. We have so much data on the importance of teams, yeah. yet we're not developing right. good teamwork yeah. in our organisations. There are light spots, I think, yeah. uh, and there are dark spots, but we need to raise the level of illumination overall. I think the other thing is just going to the workforce and saying, what's not working? What problems mm -hmm. are you finding? Because I think it's a lot of it will be organisational and it will be leader-led. Um, but I think that there's great value in going to the junior doctors, the nurses, the midwives, the ancillary staff and saying, what's not working for you? What's making your life more difficult? What things could we change? What would help you? Yeah. And I think that there's got to be that focus there as well and not just looking at what leadership can change but what staff actually want and what they think will help because they're there doing it every day. It's probably the most motivated and skilled workforce in the whole of industry. Why do we manage them through command and control? I know, Don, when we last met, you made this really insightful comment, said we should just have one rule for NHS staff, which is you said do what, what you know to be the right thing, and it has resounded with me ever since. Yeah. It's still my advice. I think the habit of control, the idea of accountability or incentive or somehow shaping the rules so that people will do the right thing as if you have to make them do the right thing is just wrong. Mm -hmm. They want to do the right thing. And so I guess my coaching would be, and it's hard to come up with one thing, but it's just please conceive of your job much more as releasing the energies of people who already know what to do yeah. than controlling them. And then just yeah. like Asha said, you're, you're doing things that keep them from doing what they want to do. Yeah. Find them and stop them. And, yeah. and the best people to tell you that are the workforce themselves. And, and there's a question from Liz Harris who says, would any organization in the NHS ever vocally and publicly put their, f their staff first before the patient? Because the fact is the staff are becoming the patients. I guess it's more of a comment, isn't it, than a, than a, than a question. So um, I think it's, I, I guess I want to say to those who are viewing that um, when we talk about these issues in comfortable surroundings here in the King's Fund and a convivial conversation, I'm aware that we've got a lot of people watching and uh, for some people these, this discussion may evoke some real feelings of discomfort about their own levels of stress and I think it's important if you become aware of that that you do take the time to seek help, go see your GP, talk with your colleagues um, and, and consider how you can be self-compassionate in this process. So I want to ask you in the little time we've got remaining a kind of personal recommendation you would make to people watching in terms of looking after their own health and well-being. Um, Anna? Well for me if you're starting to notice that you don't care it's one of the biggest signs I think that you might need to take some time out to reflect it's associated with dissociation you know that you're you, you're not really being your authentic self anymore and you're you disconnecting disconnecting from, from yeah. the people around you and mm. feeling isolated on your own so go and not be on your own go and seek some help and have a chat with someone and don't be scared to talk about that actually it's just the first little indicator I think I would follow on from that that mm. you're not the only one experiencing no. this I think you know that we're saying about 50% of doctors are burnt out so find your tribe almost find the people around you that you can talk to about this and once you start talking about it I think you'll realize that you're not alone mm. in this problem mm. um, and it's uh, you know I very much am a fan of a problem shared as a problem halved and you know it's not going to fix the problem but I think being able to start openly talking about it's really yeah. important thank you Tom. exactly the same uh, you're not alone yeah. and you're not weak no. You know, this is not about who's stronger. The, the strength lies in j joining others and realizing a you know, pain shared is halved, and and that's the, the solution will lie in your in your social connections and the people you love. I think it's important for them to see the fact that we're having panels like this and opening up to a broader audience that there's an acceptance, mm -hmm. and people aren't on their own. You know that that other people realize this is an issue, and other people want to fix it. Um, lots of people comment in want to fix it so so anyone that is you know is worried then the good thing is there's a 
there isn't a stigma around it. There is a collective that care. Um, and I think that you know, many people that are in the health service actually are there because they are compassionate. Mm -hmm. So the fact they're there and they're struggling, then they should lean on people that also are compassionate. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. I think it's really important to um, emphasize that we working in healthcare have to take care of ourselves. And as the panel have said, the most important way that we can care for our own well-being is spending quality time with the people we love and who love us. That makes more of a difference to our well-being than anything else. And it's also the obvious things about sleep and exercise and continuing to learn and grow. Um, and giving to others. When, when we give to others, when we take care of others, then it has, a, as you were saying, Don, a really beneficial impact on our own well-being. And it's learning to be present the more time we spend ruminating about the past and being anxious about the future. The less time we're able to see the faces of our loved ones, look at the beauty of nature, to see the beautiful intricacy of a leaf on a tree outside. So it is about making sure we take care of ourselves, but also I think this conversation for me is reinforcing the imperative that systemically we have to take action to create an NHS which is the best place to, to work for all of our staff. So a huge heartfelt thank you to all of you for taking part in this conversation and a huge heartfelt thank you to all of you for joining us and contributing through your questions. We will share all of the questions with the panel. Thank you for joining us. Take good care of yourself. Thank you.